If you are watching online, I would invite you to visit our website, lawrencecentral.org, and there is a a giving screen for you to uh, use if you would like to support the ministries here at Central. Um, As we come together again after so many months of of, of worshiping solely online, um, I I hope that today's worship will be... um, have a special meaning for you. I know it does for me. I've missed seeing you all. I know we kind of see each other on Facebook, but um, it's not the same as being here in person together. And so um, I'm excited. I hope you are. You are too. Um, I invite all of us now at this time to prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits to worship. Uh, If you will please join Becky as she leads us in our call to worship. Uh, For those of you here, the response will be on the screen, as it will be for everyone who is joining us online. So let us worship this day. We come to worship God who has made us and knows us. We come to celebrate God's presence among us. We come to follow Jesus, who leads us to new life. We come with joy, knowing in Christ we have eternal life. We come to listen to the Holy Spirit, who calls us forth. May we enter this worship, knowing the Spirit is alive among us. Amen. And now, if you would please join me in our opening prayer. Lord of peace and hope, We open our hearts to you this day. Be with us as we hear your words of inspiration and healing. Guide our hearts and spirits as we seek to be witnesses to your redeeming and reconciling love. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. Amen. Our opening hymn this day, uh, a little, a day late, celebrating July 4th, but our opening hymn is America the Beautiful. I invite you to join in singing. time of prayer, I would invite uh, any prayer requests that uh, are is among the community today to be shared. If you are watching online, please let us know by uh, commenting uh, under the video, uh, and we will make sure that we get those requests added to our prayer concerns. Uh, as 
We are coming back together in worship. I have a special prayer for, for everyone who is uh, not able to join us today, whether they are ill or whether um, they are traveling, uh, a special prayer of blessing to be among them. Are there other joys or concerns? It's a joy just to be together. I think at this point, I know a lot of us have missed coming and gathering together. If there are uh, no other uh, concerns or joys today, I would invite you to um, join us in this time of prayer. Becky will lead us in our prayer of confession, and then you will have some time to pray to, uh, silently, and then I will lead us in a pastoral prayer, and we will conclude together in the Lord's Prayer. So would you join at this time? Merciful and loving God, we are so grateful for your redeeming love for each one of us. We confess that there have been times of doubt in our spirits. We confess that when the times of difficulties are upon us, we don't always believe that you will take our burdens. We feel we have to always be in control, trying to demand the desired outcome. Help us to place our trust in you Remind us that you surround us continually with your care. You never just let us go to drift aimlessly about. Open our hearts and spirits again to your healing powers. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the one who will take our burdens and give us peace. Gracious and loving God, we come before you this day, some of us with joy in our hearts, for opportunities to see friends that we have missed these last weeks, some of us with concern in our hearts, concern for a pandemic that shows no signs of slowing down. Concern for our friends and our loved ones who are vulnerable to this illness. God, we come before you this day rejoicing that no matter what our circumstances in life, that you are still God. And that when things seem out of control, we know that you are there and that you are in control. Maybe not in ways that we anticipate or can readily see, but you are in control nonetheless. Father, we come before you this day with concerns for those of our friends and family who we are worried about, a nation that seems more divided than ever, a community that has those within it who do not receive the same liberties and justices that most of us celebrated yesterday. God, we lift these, these people to you, asking that your justice and your liberty wash over them, that they would be reminded that they are your children. And that we would be reminded, Father, that you call us to seek justice and truth and liberty for all. God, we're living in days where our words seem so important. Not only what we say and how we say, but what we don't say. God, give us the courage to be your people. To answer the call that you have placed upon our lives God, give us the wisdom to use our words well. In a time when so many half-truths circulate 
in the media, in the news, in the social media, in our normal conversations with people. Help us discern what is true. And that is the word that you have placed within our hearts. God, we thank you this day for all of the blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you freely, regardless of pandemics, but freely without worry of, of persecution for being your church. God, we pray especially for uh, all of the new pastors who are meeting their congregations in worship for the very first time today. We lift especially our neighbors down the street. God, I would ask that you would be with Kay this morning as she delivers her first message to First Church and that uh, you would bless her and bless that congregation as they begin this new chapter of their ministry together. God, you are so good to us. Even when we aren't necessarily as good as we should be. Thank you for loving us despite of ourselves. Thank you for continuing to bless us as individuals and as your church. We give you all of the praise and honor and glory that you are due. And with one voice, we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
got all excited on that. Wow. <laughs> Our scripture lesson today is from Luke 20, verses 19 through 15. He began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next, he sent another slave. That one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent still a third. This one also they wounded and threw out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Hmm? <laughs> surely, surely this commandment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. I'll, I'll take care of the Deuteronomy okay. one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's next. Just proving that when you don't do things on a regular basis, you fall out of the habit. Okay, guys, I'm, I'm gonna, you who are here, I've had three months of preaching to an empty room. Make your, your laughs big. The, the jokes will be cornier than usual, just so that we can get a little, a little uh, repartee here going. Uh, I will read the Deuteronomy text this morning. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 20. And it says this, Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us, so that we might hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us, so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his numerous, observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. May God add his, add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word this day. Well, today we are starting a new sermon series called Half-Truths. And I think that now, perhaps more than ever before, we are becoming more and more aware that words matter. Words really do matter. What we say, how we say it, and how accurate and truthful the words that we say and the words that we hear are. Now this is true in every aspect of our lives and our Christian lives are not exempt from words uh, that we say and hear from being 100% truthful either. So we're going to spend the next few weeks learning and talking about some phrases that we hear and perhaps some that we even say ourselves. They're things that we have come to believe 
They sound Christian. They sound like they should be in the Bible. But they aren't things that are necessarily carefully examined for 100% accuracy. Now, we might even believe that some of these phrases are in Scripture, but they really aren't. Here's what I mean. Here's an example. I would hear a particular phrase a lot when we lived in Utah. Um, When there was a death, particularly when there was an unexpected death um, of someone very young, And the phrase that I would hear is this. Well, God just needed another angel in heaven. And I would smile at the person who would say it and perhaps nod a bit and maybe kind of half-heartedly agree because when someone is going through grief, they need to hear and think comforting thoughts. But what I really thought inside but didn't say was this. Are you kidding me? God has legions of angels at his disposal. He certainly didn't need one more. Now, sure, the idea of a loved one who has died going on to become an angel is comforting. But it's not very true, or at least it's not completely true. And it's not found anywhere in Scripture that when someone dies, they go to become an angel. Now, the phrases that we're going to look over or look at over the next several weeks are other examples. Now, we start this, as we start this worship series, we need to remember that the Bible can be used to support any number. Of things. If we look carefully enough, we will find Bible passages that would support nearly every one of these half truths that we'll look at. People who use corporal punishment on their children, you know, who beat them or or spank them, um, they can find actions to support, or they can find scripture to support their actions in Proverbs. Those who withhold the rod hate the child or we know it, spare the rod, spoil the child. Well, does this mean that I have permission to start beating my kids? Now, yes, I realize that they are 24 and 21, but they still sometimes do some boneheaded things. So do I have permission now to start beating them whenever I want? Maybe not. Our Wesleyan heritage teaches us that we need to examine our Christian experiences through four lenses. We're going to go back to confirmation class here just for a second. Um, You may know this as the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So first we, we examine things through the lens of Scripture. What does the Bible say? We also then use tradition. What has been the practice of the church for centuries? Experience, what has our life experience taught us about God and about our Christian journeys and how we should respond? And finally, and I have to confess, this is my favorite one, reason. What do you think about it? What I love most about the Methodist tradition is that we are not required to check our brains at the door We're supposed to think. We're supposed to reason things as we look through this lens at our Christian experience. Now, as I said, it's very easy to to find verses to support anything you think or believe or think you believe about anything. But that's not how we're supposed to read the Bible. We're supposed to read the entire Bible in the light of Jesus' life and his teachings. And as all of us do this, you and I might come to different interpretations of what we're reading, and that is absolutely fine. We are still allowed to be United Methodists together, even if we don't agree on everything. So over these next few weeks, I might say something that you don't agree with. That is absolutely fine. 
All I ask is that you stop and consider and think. And if we don't agree, that's fine. So we're starting our our series today with the phrase, everything happens for a reason. Now for this statement to be completely true, we need to agree that we live in a world of cause and effect. Actions create consequences and our choices produce results. Now someone who chooses to text while they're driving or, or to drive after they're drinking may end up causing a wreck, cause and effect. In the chapter of Deuteronomy that I read, Moses is preaching to the Israelites about cause and effect. Choose life in order that you may live. The issue is that when we say everything happens for a reason, we're usually speaking in response to suffering. I mean, no one usually says, well, everything happens for a reason when something good happens. Very rarely does that happen. But when something bad happens, oh, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. And when something bad has happened and we're trying to comfort someone, we say things like this. Or other ones, well, it was just meant to be. Well, it was his time. It was her time. It was part of God's plan. And if we really honestly believe what we're saying, we're believing that God is in charge of everything, so whatever happens reflects his will and his purpose. So God is controlling everything, right? So when the KU men's basketball team loses, or the Kansas City Chiefs lose, or the Royals, once they can start playing, lose. It must be God's will, right? Or when we forget something that we needed to do. Well, God just didn't mean for me to do that. If we say and honestly believe everything happens for a reason, this is the reality of what our words mean. So if everything is in God's will and everything happens for a reason, we can arrive at some very disturbing questions, at least for me. If everything happens for a reason, was it God's will that millions of Jews died in the Holocaust? Was it God's will that someone walks into a school and kills children? Is it God's will that a pandemic has killed over half a million people worldwide? Consider this. Maybe everything doesn't happen for a reason, or at least not a reason controlled by God. Because the alternative is that the God we worship has a really cruel streak and causes accidents and diseases and suffering. I don't believe that. I hope you don't either. There are some other problems with everything doesn't happen, or with, um, with believing that everything happens for a reason. If that's the case, then personal responsibility is eliminated. God becomes an easy scapegoat for actions that we are making the choice to do. If I cheat on my husband, it must be God's plan, Right? No, you're not buying that? Well, that's good, because Todd probably wouldn't either. (laughs) Another problem with the phrase, everything happens for a reason, is that it can lead to fatalism and indifference. A fatalist thinks that whatever is going to happen is going to happen, and what will be will be, and that we are powerless to change it. So don't bother buckling your seatbelt on the ride home because, well, if it's your time to die in a car wreck, you're going to die in a car wreck, regardless of whether you're wearing your seatbelt or not. Now, before you leave here with your mind blown because your pastor doesn't believe that God is really in control, hold on just a minute. 
let's take a look at the ideas of providence and sovereignty. Providence typically refers to God's governance of the universe. And as Christians, we believe that God oversees what happens on our planet. Sovereignty usually expresses the idea of authority or rule. And we believe that God has authority over everything. But we can interpret these concepts a little bit differently. Some folks believe that God is a micromanager and that we do nothing of our own free will. We just thought we chose this outfit today, but really God made the decision for it and put it in our heads. Other people believe that God created everything. He set the world in motion and said, have at it, folks. And there's people who are everywhere in between those two, um, those two ends of the spectrum. So we have to decide for ourselves, after looking at the stories in Scripture as an entire unit, we have to decide, is God directing everything according to his will? Or is God more like a parent who teaches his children what is right and what is wrong and lets them make their own choices with the knowledge that sometimes we are going to make the wrong ones? Let's go back to the original story of creation and look at Adam and Eve. God created everything, the land and the sea, the night and the day, the creatures. And then he created humankind, and he tells them, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. God created and then gave humanity dominion. God has put people in charge of what happens on earth. Now, that doesn't mean that God isn't ultimately in charge, but it does mean that God has given us the responsibility to rule over the planet on his behalf. But then, God goes and he puts this tree right in the middle of the garden and tells Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit from this tree. Have you ever wondered why God put that tree in there in the first place? I mean, when you think about it, it it's like, you know, our ki little kids putting a plate of cookies in front of them and saying, now, don't touch, don't eat. Why did God put this choice in the garden to begin with. Maybe it was to teach us that part of being human is having to make choices between following God's path or turning away from it. God gives us the freedom to make choices for better or for worse. So when we do something wrong, can we really blame God? Can we really say, well, everything happens for a reason, and so God must have wanted this to happen? The parable that Becky read this morning from Luke illustrates this point. Jesus reminds us that we are the tenants farming God's earth. It was the tenant's choice to kill each slave each consecutive slave as they came as they came and then finally to kill the owner's son they were free to choose to do the right thing or the wrong thing and we are the same we are f free to make choices to do the right thing or the wrong thing and we are ultimately responsible for our choices the words that Moses spoke in Deuteronomy came just after he has delivered the Ten Commandments. 
It's the first time anybody has heard these laws. And he didn't just say, okay, here are the laws, follow them. He followed it up. He reminds the Israelites and us what God expects. Sometimes we make decisions based upon what God expects of us, and sometimes we don't. As I mentioned earlier, these are things that we're going to have to decide for ourselves. Everything happens for a reason. Yes or no? For me, the answer is no. I don't believe that God dictates our choices for us. I have way too many examples of poor life choices to believe that God caused me to make them. A couple of hairstyles from the 1980s are popping into mind right now. Stacy's over there rolling her eyes too. (laughs) But I do believe instead that God gave us a brain and a heart and a conscience. He gave us the scriptures as a guide and he gave us the Holy Spirit living inside us to help us select the right path. There's a meme that has made its way around social media. It says, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes that reason is you're stupid and make bad decisions. It's a bit harsh, but it speaks the truth. The reason most things happen is not because God willed them but because of decisions that we make or the laws that govern nature and our intersection with them. So can we still believe that everything happens, doesn't necessarily happen for a reason, but yet God is still in control? Yeah, I think we can. When we face the consequences of our decisions... He is with us. He is helping us. He is encouraging us to get back on track. He is strengthening us for our continued journey. But he isn't going to force us. The choice is still ours, and we have the freedom to make our choices. And what about the things, though, that happen that aren't the result of choices that we make, but are the result of us living in a broken and fallen world in which sin abounds. What about the medical diagnosis? I've been dealing with that one a lot. Not only personally, but with my daughter as well. Mom, why did this happen? She grew up in a culture that taught everything happens for a reason. How does a 24-year-old diagnosed with cancer come to the conclusion that sometimes cancer hits, sometimes cancer gets people. What about the millions of people who have lost their job because of a pandemic? What about the people who lose their home and their livelihood because of natural disasters? Those aren't results of choices that they've made. But they are the result of living in a broken and fallen world. But even though those things happen, Romans 8, 28 promises us that God works for all things, works together for all things for good, for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. The promise is that no matter what happens, no matter how bad things are, God will somehow bring good out of the situation. Let me share a story that happened to me. Oh, back in May, my son-in-law, for a surprise for my daughter, um, 
for their anniversary and as she started to fight her cancer battle, contacted everybody he knew, family members, friends, and said, record a little video of encouragement to Emily. I'm going to have my sister put it together and I'm going to give it to her on our anniversary. So great. I record my little snippet of my video and my son-in-law's daughter, or son-in-law's, no, not daughter, he doesn't have one of those yet. My son-in-law's sister sent me, I don't know how she mistyped her phone number incorrectly, but she sent me a wrong phone number. It was off by one digit. So I send my video to this person who is not Jake's sister, and I get this kind of hateful text back. Who are you people? Because she had sent the wrong phone number to a lot of different people. And so this stranger is getting videos wishing this Emily person good luck as she begins her, her fight with cancer. And this person has no idea who it is. And so this text message comes and says, quit sending me texts. I work for the police department. I'm going to, re I'm going to report this when I get into the office. I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting because my son-in-law is a police officer in that town. And so I send a text back apologizing profusely that, oh, I'm so sorry. My daughter has cancer. These videos are meant for her. I'm, I'm sorry that you're getting all of these. And so I start this text conversation with this person who says, oh, well, I'm so sorry. Tell me some more about your daughter. And through about a half hour of text messages, this person says, well, here are all the videos I've received. Make sure they get to the right person. And could I please have your daughter's name? I would like to pray for her. God is in control. Every, bringing good out of every situation. We need to recognize that, yes, terrible things happen in this world. But we also need to recognize and remember that these terrible things will not have the final word. And that is a whole truth that we can believe in. Amen. Well, folks, we've almost made it to the end of our first in-person worship. Again, I'm so glad that you were all able to come today. Um, as more people are, are beginning to feel more comfortable, I'm sure we will have more. If you're online, you can see we have plenty of room for you. So whenever you are comfortable coming back, uh, we are anxiously awaiting your return. And if you are one of the folks who have been joining us uh, just because you happen to stumble across our worship on Central, we invite you uh, to come and worship with us in person as well. As we prepare to depart from this place and out into the world, a couple of announcements as well. Uh, this worship series that we're starting this month comes with some daily devotional opportunities. And so watch your email. Um, if later tonight or early tomorrow, we will send these out to you. They're just a daily scripture and some thoughts about... Uh, the half-truth that we will talk about on Sunday. So the one you'll get uh, this week, we'll talk about a little bit more in depth about everything happens for a reason. And if you are not on our email, if you happen to be online and would like those, uh, drop a comment or send an email to the church and we will make sure that we get you added to that as well. Uh, we are going to start some in-person small group things, very small group, and that first is going to be a book club that will start a week from tomorrow on the book Just Mercy. And this is um, a perfect opportunity if you're seeing the news um, 
about what is happening regarding racial injustice and inequality in our country, but you aren't really sure what you can do about it, this is a perfect way uh, to kind of dip your toe into that pool and learn about some of these things. And so uh, find a copy of the book. I have two um, that I can can give you, but otherwise you can find it um, online uh, in several different places, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, Cokesbury I think has it. You can check with some of our local bookshops here in town. Uh, we're going to do it in person and Zoom at the same time, so uh, if you want to participate but aren't comfortable coming to the church, um, let me know and so I can send you the Zoom invitation for that. Um, if you would like to participate in person, we have three people so far who are wanting to do that. Um, we need to know that as well because we're limiting the class to about 15 at most so we can keep social distancing guidelines going on. So uh, email the church office or call the church office, email me or call me and we will get you signed up for that. Uh, the folks who are associated with Central Cares ask me to remind you that that ministry is still going on. Central Cares started a couple months ago for people uh, to have someone to talk to if they were a little nervous or anxious about what is going on um, with the pandemic. And uh, I know we've had several people who have made use of that opportunity. Um, Things have changed. We're, we're in even more a state of flux right now. It's safe to go out. It's not safe to go out. Wear masks. Don't wear masks. Oh, yeah, wear masks again. So um, if you're finding yourself anxious or just wanting to talk to somebody, um, let me know, and I will put you in contact with someone who is part of that Central Cares ministry. Um, youth. You need to let our youth leader, Todd, know by tomorrow if you're going to go play mini golf and ride go-karts on Saturday. It's an outside activity, plenty of social distancing. Um, cost is $5, but don't let that stop you. Um, we will take care of that if you want to uh, go play golf, but he does need to make the reservation. So please drop him an email or, let him, or give him a call to let him know. Our closing hymn this day as, as we finish up our worship, God will take care of you. Oh. Let's join. Be not dismayed, whatever be tight, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love above,
Uh, just a reminder, as we leave, uh, please wait for the ushers to dismiss you so we keep from munching up as we depart uh, from the sanctuary. And now receive the benediction. May the God of truth be with you now and always. May the Son of truth guide your words and actions. May the Spirit of truth empower and support you on your journey. Go in peace to love and to serve, to live out your truth. Amen. Thank you.